Hello, uh, this is uh, Sean Kelly, and um, as you uh, may have heard, um, film scholar David Bordwell has uh, passed away at the age of 76 after a uh, long struggle of uh, degenerative uh, lung disease. And um, if you haven't heard the name uh, David Bordwell before, is that he was pretty much one of the most important uh, figures in film studies with uh, this book right here, uh, Film Art and Introduction being uh, required reading in uh, most uh, university film schools, including uh, my time at uh, York University in the mid-2000s. So um, I thought as a bit of a tribute for David Burrow, I'll read an uh, excerpt from uh, Film Art and Introduction. So this is from the uh, third chapter of the book, and it is talking about the difference between plot and story. We make sense of a narrative, then, by identifying its events and linking them by cause and effect, time and space. As viewers, we do other things as well. We often infer events that are not explicitly presented, and we recognize the presence of material that is extraneous to the story world. In order to describe how we perform such activities, we can draw a distinction between story and plot, sometimes called story and discourse. Since this is basic understanding narrative form, we need to examine it in a little more detail. We often make assumptions and inferences about events in a narrative. For instance, at the start of Alfred Hitchcock's North by Northwest, we know we are in Manhattan at rush hour. The queues stand out clearly. Skyscrapers, bustling pedestrians, and congested traffic. We watch Roger Thornhill as he leaves an elevator with his secretary, Maggie, and strides through the lobby dictating memos. On the basis of these cues, we start to draw some conclusions. Vornhill is an executive who leads a busy life. We assume that before we saw Vornhill and Maggie, he was also dictating to her. We have come in on the middle of a string of events in time. We also assume that the dictating began in the office, before they got on the elevator. In other words, we infer causes, a temporal sequence, and another locale even though none of this information has been directly presented. We are probably not aware of having made these inferences, but there are no less firm for going unnoticed. The set of all these events in a narrative, both the ones explicitly presented and those the viewer infers, constitutes the story. In our example, the story would consist of at least two depicted events and two inferred ones. We can list them, putting the inferred events in parentheses. Roger Foreman has a busy day at the office. Inferred. Rush hour hits Manhattan. While dictating his secretary Maggie, Roger leaves the office and they take the elevator. Inferred. Still dictating. Roger gets off the elevator with Maggie and they stride through the lobby. The total world of the story is sometimes called the film's digesis, the Greek word for recounted story. In the opening of North by Northwest, the traffic, streets, skyscrapers, and people we see, as well as the traffic, streets, skyscrapers, and people we assume to be off-screen, are all diegetic because they are assumed to exist in the world that the film depicts. The term plot is used to describe everything visibly and audibly present in the film before us. The plot includes, first of all, the story elements that are directly depicted. In our North by Northwest example, only two story events are explicitly presented in the plot. Rush Hour, and Roger Forehound's dictating to Maggie as they leave the elevator. Second, the film's plot may contain s material that is extraneous to the story world. For example, while op 
the opening of North by Northwest is portraying Rush Hour in Manhattan, we also see the film's credits and hear orchestral music. Neither of these elements is diegetic since they are brought in from outside the story world. The characters cannot read the credits nor hear the music. Credits and such extraneous music are thus non-diegetic elements. At this point, we need to only notice that the film's plot, the totality of the film, can bring in non-diegetic material. Non-diegetic material may occur elsewhere than in credit sequences. In the bandwagon, we see the premiere of a hopelessly pretentious musical play. Eager patrons follow into the theater and the camera moves closer to a poster above the door. There then appear three black and white images. Accompanied by a brooding chorus, these images and sounds are clearly non-diegetic, inserted from outside the story world in order to signal that the production was catastrophic and laid an egg. The plot has added material to the story for comedic effect. In sum, story and plot overlap in one respect and diverge in others. The plot explicitly presents certain story elements, so these events are common to both domains. The story goes beyond the plot in suggesting some diegetic elements which we never witness. The plot goes beyond the story world by presenting non-diegetic images and sounds that may affect our understanding of the story. A diagram of the situation would look like this. Uh, we can think about these examples between story and plot from two perspectives. From the standpoint of the storyteller, the filmmaker, the story is the sum total of all the events in the narrative. The storyteller can present some of these events directly that is, make them part of the plot, can hint at events that are not presented, and can simply ignore other events. For instance, though we learn later in North by Northwest that Roger's mother is still close to him, we never learn what happened to his father. The filmmaker can also add non diegetic material as an example from the bandwagon. In a sense, then, the filmmaker makes a story into a plot. From the perceiver's standpoint, things look somewhat different. All we have before us is the plot, the arrangement of material in the film as it stands. We create the story in our minds on the basis of cues in the plot. We also recognize when the plot presents non-diegetic material. The story-plot distinction suggests that if you want to give someone a synopsis of a narrative film, you can proceed in two ways. You could summarize the story, starting from the very earliest incident that the plot cues you to assume or infer, and running straight through to the end. Or you can tell them the plot, starting with the first incident you encountered in watching the film. Our initial definition and the distinction between plot and story constitute a set of tools for analyzing how narrative works. We shall see that the story plot distinction affects all three aspects of narrative casuality, time, and space. Now, you, that's a bit uh, scholarly for um, uh, laymen out there, but uh, we could see that David Borwell's distinction between plot and story is something that I uh, still use in my writing today, and a lot of people confuse the story of a film with being the plot, but like the plot is specifically all of the things that you specifically see on the screen in the film. So, uh, rest in peace to uh, David Bordwell. I have written a obituary for him on the site, and I uh, hope you enjoyed this little piece of film theory, and I will see you next time.